All right. It is the 75th birthday of the CIA. Because that marks the day when Truman signed the CIA into law. The National Security Act of 1947, yo. Look at this. They posted it on Twitter and they don't <laughs> they don't care at how evil they have been forever. They just posted this on Twitter. I'm probably when I start my like better channel where I'm making really highly polished content instead of informal rants, I'm probably going to just make a video on the CIA because uh yeah, I can. But uh, <laughs> I don't have time to do all that today. So I just thought I would uh, briefly mention an interesting set of interesting coincidences, right? Or should I say an interesting set of interesting coincidences. If I were Bill Maher, I might have an audience laughing at me. Whatever. The point is that, uh, yeah, there's an interesting coincidence that maybe should be talked about more. And I think, you know, since I'm one of those loony people, people keep on, like, uh, <laughs> talking a bunch of shit about, I might as well uh, talk about that. So, to get back to the roots here, let's talk about something very interesting. That uh, Prescott Bush was the, uh, the big old granddad of the Bush family. You got Prescott, you got H.W., you got Junior. So, he was the reason that they had political power. And I just thought I'd read something interesting. Because I already know this and I've already talked about this, but this is on Wikipedia. It's just interesting, isn't it? Look at this. Look how interesting this is. Look at the Union Banking Corporation, where it says, Bush was a founder and one of the seven directors, including W. Averill Her Herriman, on the Union Banking Corporation. In holding a single share out of 4000 as a director. An investment bank that operated as a clearinghouse for many assets and enterprises held by a uh, German steel magnate, Fritz Dyson. An early supporter and financier of the Nazi party. In July 1942, the bank was suspected of holding gold on behalf of Nazi leaders. A subsequent government investigation disproved those allegations, but confirmed the Dyson's control. And in October 1942, the United States seized the bank under the Trading with the Enemy Act and held the assets for the duration of World War II. Journalist Duncan Campbell pointed out documents showing that Prescott Bush was a director and shareholder of a number of companies involved with Thyssen. Bush was the director of the Union Banking Corporation that represented Thyssen's U.S. interests, continuing to work for the bank after America's entry into World War II. You know, I just think that's interesting. Just a little bit interesting, don't you think? And here is an interesting article written on the Interesting Guardian, where it says that uh, he helped Hitler's rise to power. And it says, a report issued by the Office of Alien Property Custodian in 42 stated of the companies that, quote, since 1939, these steel and mining properties have been in possession of and have been operated by the German government and have undoubtedly been of considerable assistance to that country's war effort. Prescott Bush, a six foot four inch charmer with a rich singing voice, was the founder of the Bush political dynasty and was once considered a political 
pres- or potential presidential candidate himself. Like his son, George, and grandson, George W., he went to Yale, Skull and Bones, where he was, again, like his descendants, a member of the secret and influential Skull and Bones Student Society. He was an artillery captain in the First World War and married Dorothy Walker, the daughter of George Herbert Walker, in 1921. In 1924, his father-in-law, a well-known St. Louis investment banker, helped him set up in business New York with Avril Harriman. The wealthy son of railroad magnate E.H. E. H. Harriman in New York, and who had gone into banking. Railroads, huh? I, I fucking wonder, you know? One of the first jobs Walker gave Bush was to manage UBC. Bush was a founding member of the bank, and the incorporation documents, which list him as one of seven directors, show he owned one share in UBC worth $125. The bank was set up by Harriman and Bush's father-in-law to provide a U.S. bank for the Thysons, Germany's most powerful industrial family. August Thyssen, the founder of the dynasty, had been a major contributor to Germany's First World War effort, and in the 1920s, he and his sons Fritz and Heinrich established a network of overseas banks and companies so their assets and money could be whisked offshore if threatened again. By the time Fritz Seyssen inherited the business empire in 1926, Germany's economic recovery was faltering. After hearing Adolf Hitler speak, Tyson became mesmerized by the young firebrand. He joined the Nazi party in December 31 and admits backing Hitler in his autobiography, I Paid Hitler, when the National Socialists were still a radical fringe party. He stepped in several times to bail out the struggling party. In 1928, Tyson had bought the Barlow Palace on uh, Breinestrasse in Munich, where Hitler converted into the Brown House, the headquarters of the Nazi Party. The money came from another Tyson overseas institution, the Bank für Handel in Schiedwart in Rotterdam. So basically, he was the guy. And he was the guy who helped with millions of dollars of gold, fuel, still, coal, and U.S. Treasury bonds. And he was the guy who helped all of this sort of butter the transition. Prescott Bush helped Nazis rise to power. That's interesting. I think that's interesting, don't you? And I've brought this up before many times, but I get called an insane conspiracy theorist a lot of the time as well because my conspiracy hypothesis over here which by the way I uh, have a a Facebook friend insisting that all conspiracy hypotheses are false because he's a stupid piece of shit so um, just to be super clear here this was a conspiracy and it's true he conspired with the Nazi government to help Hitler rise to power. You know, I just think that's fucking interesting. And why do I think it's interesting? And why do I think it's relevant? Well, you know how uh, he had his political career sort of jettisoned a little bit when it was found out he was aiding and abetting Hitler's rise to power? You know, that little bump in the road. Um, Well, wouldn't you know it, That didn't stop him from having a family. And what did his family do? Partially empowered by the money that was, you know, garnered from Nazis. Partially empowered by the legacy that he got from helping the Nazis. Well, gee golly, wouldn't it be a darn heckin' shocker if his son became... Involved with the CIA. Well, hey, you know, you don't have to wonder because uh, if you look at this, he uh, was his son. (laughs) On Britannica, it says later in 1974, Gerald Ford, who had nominated Nelson Rockefeller, Rockefeller, like the Rockefellers involved in the current money scheme and the CBDC and ID 2020 and, you know, 
everything I've been talking about being evil and fascist, uh, as his vice president, na named a disappointed Bush chief of the U.S. liaison office in Beijing, which was then the senior U.S. representative in China, because relations between the two countries did not permit the exchange of ambassadors. He served in this capacity until he was asked to head the Central Intelligence Agency. In 1976, as CIA director, Bush took steps to ensure that the agency's activities did not exceed congressional authorization. When Jimmy Carter took office in 1977, Bush resigned and returned to Texas, where in 1979 he announced his candidacy for president. Hey, isn't that adorable? Jimmy Carter. Who could hate Jimmy Carter? I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Because, um, you know, I hate Jimmy Carter. And uh, a lot of people get weird when I say that because, oh no, Habitat for something or other. Fucking peanuts or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no. Fuck Jimmy Carter. But before we get to that, another interesting fact. Reinhard Galen was a German lieutenant general and intelligence officer. He was chief of the Wehrmacht Foreign Army's East Military Intelligence Service on the Eastern Front during World War II, spymaster of the CIA-affiliated anti-communist Galen organization, and the founding president of the Federal Intelligence Service, uh, Bundesnachrichtendienst. <laughs> I, I always forget how to pronounce that, but German words ha have a tendency of, like, being very long. Of West Germany, during the Cold War. What was the Galen Org? Aw, shucks. The Galen Org uh, was an intelligence agency established in June by U.S. occupation authorities in the U.S. zone of post-war occupied Germany and consisted of former members of the 12th Department of the German Army General Staff, Foreign Armies East, or FHO. It was headed by Reinhard Galen, who had previously been a Wehrmacht Major General and head of the Nazi German military intelligence in the Eastern Front during World War II. Darn it! The CIA just happens to affiliate with Nazis. Man, aw shucks. And if you look at this, you know... There's just a whole heckin' lot of, um, you know, problems with it. Not the least of which was that once the org emerged into the public eye, his group drew criticism from both sources in the West and the East. An article by uh, Sefton Delmer, senior correspondent for London's Daily Express, on the 17th of March, 52, made Galen public. Two and a half years later... On the 10th of August, 54, Delmer wrote that Galen and his Nazis are coming, implying his, in his story that a continuation of nothing less than Hitler's aims was at hand through the org's monstrous underground power in Germany. In 06, after reviewing the selected declassified CIA documents on the Galen org, a Guardian article offered a new perspective on this attempt to fight communism with some ex-Nazis. Quote, for all the moral compromises involved in hiring former Nazis, it was a complete failure in intelligence terms. The Nazis were terrible spies. Fuck! They, they, they strung it along so that they could, you know, not be lumped together with the ones that were being executed and or, you know, fucked with in some way? Gee, man, that couldn't have been their plan all along. Communist groups and governments castigated Galen's group as fanatical and virulent agents of revenge and of American imperialism, fitting the party's general line that the West was plotting a revival of Nazi power. Uh, Alwa Brunner, alleged, alleged to be an org operative, was formerly responsible for the Drancy internment camp near Paris and linked to the murders of 140,000 Jews during the Holocaust. According to Robert Wolfe, historian at the U.S. National Archives, quote, U.S. Army intelligence accepted Reinhard Galen's offer to furnish alleged expertise on the Red Army and was bilked by the many mass murderers he hired. James Critchfield later went on to say in an interview with a reporter, quote, there's no doubt that the CIA got carried away with recruiting some pretty bad fucking people. 
I added the fucking, but I felt like it. So, the American National Security Archive states that Galen, quote, employed numerous former Nazis and no known war criminals. An article in Der Spiegel featured this headline on 16th February 2011. The Nazi criminals who became German spooks, the article states. CIA documents turned up by the BND's historical department show that the Bundestag, Germany's parliament, was also informed about the matter. According to these documents, Reinhard Galen, head of the org and later president of the BND, told the Bundestag's Committee on European Defense in December 11th, 1953, that around 40 of his employees came from the Schutzstaffel and Stormtroopers. If there was ignorance on the matter, it was only because no one wanted to know. Not Galen, not Adenauer, not Globke, and presumably many others as well. was allowed to employ at least 100 former Gestapo or SS officers. This is from The Independent, right? Among them were Adolf Eichmann's deputy, Alois Brunner, who would go on to die of old age... Always? I, I don't fucking care. Of old age, despite having sent more than 100,000 Jews to ghettos or internment camps, and ex-SS major Emil Augsburg... Many ex-Nazi functionaries, including uh, Silberbauer, the captor of Anne Frank, transferred over from the Galen Org to the BND. Instead of expelling them, the BND even seems to have been willing to recruit more of them, at least for the few years. And then, of course, they fucking, like, lost because the Soviets penetrated. And they also had a bunch of rat lines which led uh, to the escape of Nazis to places like South America. So maybe that wasn't a good thing, but the CIA did it anyway because them commies damn bad is yes, right? We gotta stop Russia, right? Well, remember when I said fuck Jimmy Carter? Yeah. Fuck Jimmy Carter. Holy shit. Let's talk about Operation Cyclone. Because I've talked about it before. But maybe this video gets shared and somebody will subscribe over it. Because Operation Cyclone was pretty heckin' bad. Was the codename for the U.S. CIA's program to arm and finance the Afghan Mujahideen in Afghanistan. From 79 to 1992, prior to and during the military intervention by the USSR in support of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. The Mujahideen were also supported by Britain's M16, who MI6, who continued, who conducted separate covert actions. The program leaned heavily towards supporting militant Islamic groups, including groups with jihadist ties that were favored by the regime of Muhammad Zia ul Haq in neighboring Pakistan, rather than other less ideological Afghan resistance groups that had also been fighting the Soviet-oriented Democratic Republic of Afghanistan administration since before the Soviet intervention. I like how they call it intervention. It, it was very, very much just an act of aggression. They should rewrite the Wikipedia article for the Ukraine thing and just call it an intervention. Be fucking the same thing. Operation Cyclone was one of the longest and most expensive covert CIA operations ever undertaken. Funding officially began with 695,000 in mid-1979, was increased dramatically to 20 to 30 million per year in 80, and rose to 630 million per year in 1987, described as the biggest bequest to any third world insurgency. The first CIA-supplied weapons were antique British Lee Enfield rifles shipped out in de December 79. By September 1986, the program included U.S. origin state-of-the-art weaponry such as uh, FM-92 Stinger surface-to-air missiles, some 2,300 of which were ultimately shipped into Afghanistan. Funding continued, albeit reduced, after the 1989 Soviet withdrawal. As the Mujahideen continued to battle the forces of President Mohammed uh, Najibullah's army during the Afghan Civil War. So, if you look at that, it's fucking <laughs> pretty bad. And then they say allegations. Some have alleged that <laughs> Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were beneficiaries 
of CIA assistance. This is challenged by experts such as Call, who note that declassified CIA records and interviews with CIA officers do not support such claims. And Peter Bergen, who argues it's worth mentioning that there is simply no evidence. <laughs> However, Sir Martin Ewens noted that the Afghan Arabs benefited indirectly from the CIA's funding through the ISI and resistance orgs, and that it has been reckoned that as many th as 35,000 Arab Afghans may have, been received, may have received military training in Pakistan at an estimated cost of $800 million in the past in the years up to and including 1988. Some of CIA's greatest Afghan beneficiaries were Arabist commanders such as Haqqani and Hekmatar, uh, who, who were key allies, Hekmatyar, I forget, like, I've heard the name, but I can't remember how it was pronounced, were key allies of Bin Laden over many years. And then it's like, you know, they funded his camp in Coast, and his, his American name was Tim Osman, you can look into that. So, you know, it's almost like they'll fund people of... Unseeming, uh, unseemly right-wing nature in order to oppose Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. Um, anything is okay as long as it opposes Russia, right? Because uh, as long as it opposes Russia or communism or something like that, this anti-communist organization continues to exist and continues to have birthdays like 75 years of them. Especially if th their assets happen to create new hubs of Nazism and theocracy that they can then have as ripe grounds of future action in both domestic and foreign affairs. You know, justifying a massive domestic and foreign spying program? It couldn't be though. I I'm just I'm just saying interesting things. This is so interesting, isn't it? Um just to state more interesting facts though, wouldn't it just be super fucking interesting if the CIA also helped import cocaine into US inner cities and helped fuel uh a drug gang in, you know, South America? Wouldn't that be interesting? It would be interesting if that was true, and it would also be interesting if uh, this helped the U.S. government uh, with dealings with Iran. You know, like maybe an Iran-Contra affair or something. Wouldn't that be interesting? And, and hey, while we're in South America for a little bit, let's uh, let's just ask if it would be interesting or not if they did more over there. You know, just like... The flavor of more that would be like, you know, helping overthrow a democratically elected leader who wasn't acting in the interest of Western capitalists. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting if he started to nationalize a bunch of shit and the U.S. government decided that that wasn't acceptable, despite the fact that they have a significant amount of control over a significant amount of other countries, a country controlling itself or at least, you know, being authoritarian in its own right is unacceptable because that's not U.S. control. It doesn't help U.S. imperialism. So, I mean, if the U.S. happened to not like somebody, they, they might, you know, have a guy famous for his helicopter use, like Pinochet, um, <laughs> work with the CIA in order to do a coup, and then a long series of human rights abuses. Wouldn't that be interesting? Darn. It couldn't be that. The U.S. wouldn't ever, you know, work with Chilean dictators in order to cement U.S. Western interests in the name of opposing communism, would they? Yeah, you know, that, that, that that's just too interesting. I can't say that. But you know what's really interesting is that this certainly isn't happening anymore. You know, it's it's certainly not happening 
right now with their assets that they've trained in another region would... Oh, shit. It is, isn't it? That would be so interesting. Wouldn't it be? It would be really interesting if the U.S. was protecting their investment over a long series of years and if they don't have any problem working with Nazis in order to do so as long as Russia is in the crosshairs or at least some form of communism. That would be really fucking interesting, wouldn't it? That'd be too interesting. Damn, I'm being too interesting. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for now, uh, and I'll give people a break, but just, you know, this might just be to the kind of reason that we should distrust the CIA and every time they have a birthday, give them a good old reminder that we know what they're up to and their kinds of activities, uh, both domestically and around the world, despite the fact that they had significant funding power in every major social network and have connections to every major payout system, you know, it's almost like the whole system is designed to prop up right-wing people, oppose any genuine leftist threat to their power, any, you know, even, you know, authoritarian leftist, but certainly anti-authoritarian leftist, and also any threat to their power, even in a capitalist sense, because if you start going off program too much, they've got things like Vault 7 and Black Sites for you, you know, it would be it would be such a, a darn shame if if this video got shared everywhere so we could give people reminders that maybe the CIA shouldn't get another 75 years and this is yet more reasons to smash the fucking state